are playing very funny witches. In Disney's comedy thriller, Hocus Pocus, a trio of 16th century witches returns from the dead in modern day Salem, Massachusetts. Like most witches, these three spend a great deal of their time in the air. <laughs> Today, we'll see how special effects artists employ such distinctly different techniques as wire rigs, specialized cranes, and miniature puppets to create the illusion of witch flight. The challenge is to have all the different um, techniques come together such that it is seamless, so that the audience is not seeing, oh, here's a puppet shot, oh, here's a blue screen shot, but in fact, what they end up looking at is a whole flying sequence. Effects producer Carolyn Soper and effects supervisor Peter Montgomery of Buena Vista Visual Effects, or BVVE, are responsible for overseeing these complicated effects. Carolyn works with the budget and schedule, while Peter selects which techniques will be used for each effect shot. Their credits include Honey, I Blew Up the Kid and Dick Tracy. On Hocus Pocus, Carolyn and Peter are fortunate to work with highly respected mechanical effects specialist Terry Frizee, who is in charge of the wire work. What, Terry, is it supposed to be down around here or all the way up on the edge? Terry's background includes 28 years of effects work on such films as Star Trek VI and 1941. But his experience in wire work goes further back than that. His father, Logan, has been flying people since Forbidden Planet in 1956. My brother and I worked for my father, and now my son works for myself. And uh, then hopefully maybe his son will work for him, keeping the family. Here at Walt Disney Studios, on the set of Hocus Pocus, Terry has a full slate of complex flight sequences. While stunt people are often called upon to perform in wide shots, most of this wire work must be performed by stars Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Kathy Najimy. Maybe on my resume at the bottom where it says all the things you do, I can say act while flying. <laughs> a, a key part of the witch's characters is the fact that they are able to fly through the air. That's something that you and I can't do. If we only use puppets, if we only use stunt doubles, the audience would never believe that they had that ability. In rigging the flying system, Terry must pay careful attention to every detail. The success of the film and the safety of the stars depends upon practiced procedures with no weak links. Terry's crew first secures 20-foot lengths of steel pipe to the rafters. A trolley with bearings travels up and down the pipe. Quarter-inch cable is strung along the pipe overhead. This is the cable that pulls the trolley across the stage. Well, if you got it, we can come down and, and go underneath that. Do you got a handline? Two control units are bolted to the stage floor at the point where the wires drop down from the rafters. Now you got a mark it, cut it. Do your thing up there. This steel spool is turned by a hand crank. It controls the horizontal motion of the actors. The rope pulley is used to execute their vertical maneuvers. A triangular piece of hardware known as an arbor is attached to the pulley running along the pipe. Two fly cables are suspended from the arbor. Frazee has chosen a cable that is nearly invisible to the camera, yet strong enough to carry a payload of up to 1,200 pounds. I can't think of anything that would be weaker than anything else. still a weight just hanging on the cable. The light bolts aren't taking anything. Right. Well, so which weight would be here. the 500-pound cables on you, probably? You know, how about these 1,200-pound cables? Yeah, they're 1,200. 1,200-pound cables would be the weak link right there. Once the flying system is assembled, it is first tested with a sandbag. Then, Terry tests the system himself. The flying harness Terry has chosen allows the actors to carry their weight with their hips and legs. The fly cables are attached to picks on either side of the harness. The picks are adjusted to perfectly balance the actor. 
Keep in mind where the end of the track is. Go ahead. An accident involving one of the film's stars could shut down the picture. So only when he is absolutely sure that the system is safe will Terry give his approval to fly the actors. Next, Terry Frizee will strap the stars into his flying rig for dramatic scenes 30 feet above the ground. Firework. Douglas Fairbanks charmed audiences in 1924 with his magic carpet ride in The Thief of Baghdad. Fairbanks' flying carpet was rigidly supported by a metal plate underneath and held up by six strands of piano wire hanging from a 90-foot crane. Wire rig flying was turned into an art form by the legendary Howard and Theodore Lidecker in the 1930s and 40s. Their revolutionary work on the Republic Pictures serials brought newfound excitement to flying scenes. The Lideckers would fly a life-size dummy over an actual landscape on wires, then film the close-ups by rigging actor David Sharp in a harness, which was also suspended by wires. This technique is still in use today. Wire work was further advanced in the 1960s when Walt Disney Pictures produced a series of high-flying adventures. The man holding the wires for these films was Academy Award winner Danny Lee, a mechanical effects expert who specialized in wire rig flying. Danny's wire work in bed knobs and broomsticks earned him an Academy Award for visual effects in 1971. For Angela, Swimming on her side, we had to put her into a special a belt that we built. Had to get uh, Angela into the staff shop to make a cast off of her. And then we hung her on three wires, and we just took her across the screen. On any Hollywood effects movie, flying the stars high above the soundstage floor is potentially dangerous for the actors and problematic for the mechanical effects supervisor. On the set of Hocus Pocus, Terry Frizee helps Bette Midler into her flying harness as director Kenny Ortega plans the next shot with cinematographer Hiro Narita. We're not, we're not, we're not throwing out the idea of a high angle. We just can't accomplish right, right. it without blue screen. Right, right. They flew about four hours a day in rehearsal, um, five days a week. Um, they flew first individually so that they could each develop their own style and we didn't let them see each other. That way they all could just connect with their broom in their own special way. So great, I just want to try to prolong it a little bit, you know. In case of Hocus Pocus, fortunately we had many trees, and the trees would visually eliminate uh, wires. Uh, even though you see it with your naked eyes, uh, they don't photograph. Take her up a little bit so we feel the... Uh when Ortega and Narita are ready to shoot, the actors are encouraged to test their wire rigs. Frizzi has installed special automated controls to facilitate the filming of an elaborate graveyard chase in which Bette is pursuing three young witch hunters. Four effects technicians are responsible for controlling the flight movements of each actor. One person controls the horizontal axis, another the vertical, a third the side-to-side -side motion, and one more manipulates the rotation. Now let's talk about this. I just, I get up, I do this, I do this, and then I look back. Okay, okay, okay. Scenes are rehearsed quickly. The actors cannot be comfortably suspended in the rigs for very long. As soon as the timing is correct, the camera rolls. One, two, three, action. See, I gave her a little later. I think a little bit too close. <laughs> the flight technicians, camera people, and performers must all work in perfect sync. This is a very difficult scene. If the technicians propel Bet too quickly, she will overtake the young actors. But if she is too far behind, her victims don't appear to be in danger. That was perfect for me. Can we do this again, please? Kenny, are we doing this again? Pick her up, Nod. We're going in one, two, three, action. Now! Cut! Cutting. Let's go. 
The special effects crew, which was led by Terry Frizee, did such a great job, and I never had any fear that anything was going to happen to me. I would do it again. I wasn't afraid. It never occurred to me that I could fall. Now it occurs to me that I could have fallen. When you see Bette Midler 30 feet above the stage, and it's clearly Bette Midler, and there's no pads underneath her, there's nothing better. Action. Later on Disney Stage One, the stars work on the close-ups that will go with this scene. As we have seen, wire work will be used for the wide shots. The key piece of equipment required in shooting flying close-ups is called a teeter rig. This counterweighted crane is perfect for getting tight, low-angle shots of the stars. The teeter rigs were definitely more comfortable for the actors. I mean, they're sitting on a chair. They have a, a wider range of movement in their upper body. It allows the actors to think about the emotions that they're trying to portray. TV marker. Due to its massive substructure, the teeter rig is suitable only for tight shots. But it is amazingly flexible in terms of three-dimensional movement. We put them on this crane, which is capable of raising them up possibly 14 feet in the air. We can dolly it down so we give them some motion. We can also pivot them 360 this way. And with a control box, and a gear drive over here on the motor, we can pivot where they sit 360 degrees. So in essence, we can do almost everything that we can do flying on wires, but we have a lot more control over it here. We'll have one guy back here operating up and down and around, one here operating the spin, and probably two guys in here doing the dollying back and forth. And then to finish the illusion, there's probably another guy underneath with the wind machine blowing the cape back. One pound six golf game for two four. Most importantly, the teeter rig gives the actors the freedom to play their parts in a safe environment. Next, we'll see how the most dramatic flying shots require a little extra movie magic. Actors aren't the only ones who fly in the movies. Special effects wizards also rely on the effectiveness of articulated puppets. Their small size and limited movements make puppets suitable only for certain long shots, but they are a crucial element in creating complete flight sequences. Right in cowgirl. We use the puppet shots for obviously any of the really wide scapes because we have a lot more control over the movement of the puppet. We have the ability to flip them around if we want to, zoom them very quickly, stop and start them um, independently of one, you know, independent speeds. Some of the most memorable flying scenes in motion picture history have incorporated puppets, such as E.T. flying against the moon. Batman soaring over Gotham City. Superman saving the citizens of Metropolis. In addition to their flexibility and overall fearless nature, puppets offer other distinct advantages. One of the things I really like about working with puppets, as you can see, you can stick pins into their bodies. They don't respond. They don't say a word. It's really nice. And um, unlike actors, they never complain. They, uh, they just sit there and take it. It's great. Creating a puppet which can convincingly portray the movements of a real actor is an extremely specialized skill. Rick Lazzarini and his team at the Character Shop in Van Nuys, California, have flown puppets ranging from Peter Pan's Tinkerbell in Hook to a horse in Wild Hearts Can't Be Broken. When Rick is asked to create and fly the witch puppets for Hocus Pocus, the first thing he does is call his staff together for a brainstorm session. We have to build three puppets um, that are on, what, a broomstick? 
a mop, and a vacuum cleaner. Uh, and these are supposed to substitute uh, for the live actresses for the full shot. To... The first phase of this project is undertaken by Rick Sculptors. They must create precisely detailed scale replicas of the film's three stars out of play. But if you look at her cheeks there, there's a slight difference. Yeah. The likenesses are always hard on something like this because you have to visualize what somebody looks like without any color or hair or any of the personal, personal qualities that make them who they are. She's got this, this weird lip thing happening here. Actually, I think we look a lot alike, so it helps to, the mirror helps a lot. The technique that Rick uses to animate the witches is rod puppetry. Uh, this involves manipulating the figure with slim rods. It's, it's real smooth. It, this is set up right now. I'm puppeteering from behind. This would be good for a, uh, you know, a profile shot. We could easily turn this around when you, if you wanted to do a front-on shot, and then I would be directly to the side. Wait, is there any way, or like for example, would there be any way, if we know we're doing a profile shot, to insert the rod from the side but still get the side-to-side -side motion? I think so. I'll Once the sculpted figures are completed, those. molds are made from dental stone, the same material used to produce false teeth. And you can see how we inject the foam in here with the skin. From these molds, the final puppet figures are cast in foam latex. This gets uh, trimmed and finished and painted. Each puppet will require props, costumes, and hair, which appear lifelike when the figures are filmed. Turkey feathers are sometimes used to represent hair on puppets. In this instance, however, soft inner layers of actual human hair were deemed to have the best weight and consistency. It's time for Kathy's fitting. Costuming is also tricky. Not only must the fabric patterns match those worn by the stars, but the garments must flow properly in flight. Now, when I operate her, in my mind, I think that I'm Sarah Jessica Parker. And we're using very, very fine silk on this because when the wind blows it, it blows really nicely. It looks very realistic, like a real witch. When the puppets are complete, Rick takes them to an effect stage at Disney Studios, where Peter Montgomery supervises the filming. What we're, what we're trying to get is to look like, she, like she's flying and lifting herself up. Like she's going like this. And looking a bit and then going back into the flying. Okay, let's, let's shoot this thing. Stand by. And if you can tell when the camera's rolling, raise your hand. Everybody? A lot of hands there. Action! When we're puppeteering, we try to be a little more graceful. We're trying to create the illusion of them being self-propelled or floating. As puppeteers, we imagine that we're doing the same thing. And, and what would we do if we were on something like that, if we were flying like Superman? When this filming is complete, BVVE takes over and integrates the puppet footage into a background aerial shot of Salem. This show, Hocus Pocus, is being shot largely on sound stages. And as a result, it feels small. And we allow the show to feel big. We allow it to feel like it's shot outside and not shot inside a phone booth. Finally, all of the individual shots are edited together. <laughs> Day, at, the, at the end of the schedule, the end of the post-production schedule, when we get to go and see the movie put together as a whole, and the sequences become flights, as opposed to an amalgamation of the different flying techniques, the different shots, that's when we feel really great. That's when we know we've done our job. While Terry Frizzee, Rick Lazzarini, and the team from BVVE use dramatically different techniques, they share a common goal, to bring human flight into the realm of reality. Coming up next, the elevator on the secret life of machines. Then find yourself guiding a dog sled in a blinding blizzard on Challenge. 
only on the Discovery Channel. Explore your world.